Hello, everyone. Welcome to Metcalf Institute's 26th Annual Public Lecture Series. I am Sunshine Menezes, Metcalf Institute's Executive Director, and we are joining you today from the traditional homelands of the Narragansett and Niantic Nations. Their lands and waters originally encompassed what is now the state of Rhode Island into Eastern Connecticut and Southern Massachusetts. We honor and respect the enduring and continuing relationship between the Narragansett and Niantic peoples and these lands by teaching and learning more about their history and present day communities and by becoming stewards of the lands that we too inhabit. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been advancing informed and inclusive public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We achieve this through science training for professional journalists, communications training for scientists, and public events like this one. We also founded the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together researchers and practitioners from across the world to make all types of science communication more inclusive and equitable. And I want to note that today is the last day for people to submit proposals for this year's symposium, which will be held this fall. This year's Metcalf Institute Public Lecture Series explores the opportunities and challenges of creating an equitable transition to clean energy. Climate change is well underway. We see this every day from the extreme precipitation events we experience here in New England, to sea level rise leading to flooded streets on sunny days in Miami, to the soaring temperatures, droughts, and more frequent catastrophic hurricanes and typhoons experienced around the world. As climate scientists have warned for decades, the effects of climate change can't be immediately stopped. However, there is a clear path to limiting the worst effects. Shifting our energy systems away from fossil fuels that produce greenhouse gases and moving toward a zero emissions future. There are many terms used to describe aspects of this transition, and you'll likely hear many of them this week. Decarbonization, electrification, carbon free energy, generation, distribution, transmission, just transition community-based energy development, and so on. Over the next month, because we'll be featuring our lectures once every week this month, we will introduce you to some of the issues related to this massive shift in how we harness and distribute energy in ways that are equitable, environmentally responsible, and economically viable. We thank you all for being here today to begin exploring this critical topic with us. I also want to note that, thanks to several generous donors, Metcalf Institute has a dollar for dollar matching opportunity this month until June 30th for all donations up to $12,500. Your gift supports public programs like this one, as well as professional development for journalists and scientists, all in the interest of advancing conversations that increase awareness and action on the urgent challenges posed by climate change and environmental inequities. If you would like your gift to be automatically doubled, please click on the link that will be shared in the chat. And now to today's lecture. When most of you or most of us think about the transition to clean energy, we think about solar and wind farms. You've likely seen or read about some of the large scale renewable energy projects that have been constructed or are under development across the country. You may know, or you may not know, that we need considerably more of this type of infrastructure to achieve the goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions. This scale of growth also needs to consider the impacts on plants, animals, and humans. This is exactly what today's speaker studies. While most plans for decarbonizing typically focus on technology and economics, Dr. Grace Wu's research integrates environmental and social factors. Dr. Wu is an assistant professor in the environmental studies program at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Before joining University of California, Santa Barbara, Dr. Wu was a Smith Conservation Fellow at the Nature Conservancy and the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. She was also a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow 
at the John Muir Institute of the Environment at UC Davis. She was trained in systems thinking and interdisciplinary approaches in the Energy and Resources Group at University of California, Berkeley. Grace is interested in the dynamics and drivers of land use change, climate change mitigation, and advancing our ability to plan for sustainable, multi-use landscapes that protect biodiversity and advance climate goals. She uses spatial science approaches to identify and understand the co-benefits and trade-offs between climate solutions and habitat conservation. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Wu to tell us more about how we can revamp energy planning processes to better address the land use dimensions of renewable energy infrastructure. I welcome Dr. Wu. Hi everyone, thank you so much Sunshine for that introduction. I'm really um, excited to be here. Um, I am going to do something unusual that I don't normally do, which is talk about multiple studies in the same talk. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me as I uh, take you through a tour of um, the studies that I've been working on with the Nature Conservancy over the last five to six years. I'm gonna start out um, with a headline um, that is the, what you typically see these days when it comes to solar siding conflicts, um, protests, uh, bans against uh, utility scale solar or wind, um, and an explanation, um, in this case, an explanation having to do with the scale, the amount of land that comes with a utility scale solar project. Um, here, the gargantuan scale points to this uncomfortable fact for this solar industry um, in comparison to the natural gas plant, only 100 miles south, producing the same amount of energy in uh, a fraction of the land area. Um, the second sentence, this dynamic encapsulates the industry's biggest obstacle to growth, that solar farms require huge amounts of land. So I want to motivate um, the work by answering this question. Does renewable energy require vast amounts of land? And um, as you'll see over the next uh, several slides, the answer is not so simple. Um, it, it, it needs to be qualified in many different ways and it has, the answers have very important implications uh, for how we plan renewable energy over the next several decades. Grace, I'm sorry to interrupt. We can't see oh. your slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back. Um, there we go. Is that visible now? Yes, thank you. Okay, so this was the slide that I was referring to, and those are the sentences that I had written um, verbally uh, read out loud. So I don't think anyone missed anything by not seeing the slide itself. Uh, so, I'm going to answer this question of renewable energy um, and whether it truly requires vast amounts of land, especially in comparison to fossil fueled electricity generation. Um, my basic argument is that we're experiencing a fundamental shift in the visibility of energy land use. And that's, that's underlying this perspective that renewable energy somehow now requires vast quantities of land in comparison to fossil fuel. So taking a look at what uh, fossil fuel electricity generation land use requirements are like, we have to first um, accept the fact that fossil fuel uh, electricity generation actually comes in multiple phases. There is something called the fuel cycle phase and then the generation phase. And importantly, they occur in different places. So as an example, with natural gas, um, natural gas extraction in the form of wells, um, these wells require road infrastructure to access them and pipelines um, to direct them to a central uh, collection facility. So the mining extraction phase has fragmentation and land use associated with that. And it's located in a particular area here, schematically, I've chosen Wyoming. And then we have to transport that natural gas um, to a processing facility, and that requires uh, miles of pipelines 
that processing and storage facility itself will require additional land use. And then another set of um, pipeline networks will then distribute that natural gas to generation facilities. And that, um, when we talk about natural gas plants, is what we see kind of at the end of that tailpipe, um, is that natural gas power plant. And in contrast, this wind and solar electricity generation, the fuel cycle and gener generation phases are now combined in a single location. So for wind farm, this, uh, this basically means we're putting wind turbines in a very large area, um, but we don't have the ancillary Trans, the ancillary uh, transportation, processing, storage, and mining infrastructure associated with that. And the solar plants are, again, concentrated, but the fuel itself is the sun. And so wherever the solar panels are located, the fuel will also be in the same area. Um, and this has specific implications, of course, on this, this visibility issue. Um, the fact that natural gas facilities require so little land um, whereas the fuel phase or the fuel cycle phase of fossil fuel, natural gas or coal, uh, encompasses about 90% of that land use footprint, which um, many of us, especially in urban places, do not experience and see. We can contrast that with this lower land use efficiency or perceived lower land use efficiency of solar and wind. As you can see, there's lower power density, uh, 50 and and three compared to a 750 for a natural gas power plant. What does this actually mean in terms of numbers? So if we put this all together, we added the total land use footprint for natural gas versus um, a typical solar plant. We're using the latest information um, from studies were just released in the last couple of years. We find that we need about 200 square meters per gigawatt hour, uh, a unit of generation of electricity. And we can contrast that with solar generation, um, which estimates put at 300 meters squared per gigawatt hour. And this assumes, importantly, a certain number of years that this power plant is operational. And then I provide a longer operational time period of 60 years. Um, and that reduces um, the amount of land per unit of energy required. Um, and that's because the longer a solar and wind power plant occupies the same parcel of land, the more efficiently it's generating electricity using that land. Um, in the literature, this is often called a land um, equivalency. So the solar and gas generation would have equivalent energy densities if the solar power plant would occupy that same parcel of land for 45 years. As a result, the longer that wind and solar farms occupy the same parcel of land, the more efficient they become. And this is something that we're already seeing uh, to date with older wind farms. The, the, a process called repowering um, is basically removing old aging wind turbines that are highly inefficient and replacing them with new ones. So basically occupying the same um, area of land, um, but now increasing that energy generation potential um, in that wind farm by 60% by repowering that site that is now at, at uh, its kind of a maximum lifetime. So my argument then is, it's not so much on a mega, uh, on a meter squared or area per unit generation um, issue that's the concern. It's really the scale, the scale of this build out that we require for uh, for achieving our decarbonization goals, is what is the most worrisome aspect of um, potential wind and solar build out. So on the left, you see this fun image of um, how America uses its land um, from Bloomberg. I encourage you to take a look at it. It's got a really nice interactive interface. Um, the main point uh, of that, in, that article is really showing that land is very much spoken for in the US. If, we're, if we are to integrate vast quantities of new energy infrastructure in this landscape, it's going to potentially be in direct comp competition with one of these existing land uses. 
in uh, the literature, particularly academic literature, um, multiple terms have been spun up to uh, coin this uh, potential new growth of a uh, new type of energy land use, um, energy sprawl, uh, green civil war, particularly because of the conflict of seemingly clean electricity and green electricity with, um, in, it, with ecological and um, environmentally sensitive land areas. And I do want to make a note that yes, I am uh, today focused on wind and solar in particular and, and its um, required transmission infrastructure. But I do want to note that uh, there are many other types of energy land uses, uh, biomass fracking, uh, the, those well pads that you saw earlier and their road infrastructure, hydropower reservoirs, and um, potential growth in new technologies such as bioenergy and carbon capture and sequestration that may require additional uh, amounts of land. So another reason why siting and land use is suddenly also become a problem and uh, of interest to both land use, uh, people interested in land use, as well as those um, typically concerned with just energy planning, is the fact that suddenly location dictates where uh, other types of infrastructure goes. Um, in the past, historically, uh, energy planners haven't been as concerned with where a natural gas power plant goes. They could conveniently site that power plant next to a ex existing transmission line, um, knowing that that power plant would generate large quantities of electricity. And so the siting of a particular power plant um, was not as onerous as the siting of dozens, if not hundreds of, of renewable energy power plants. This leads to something called um, a chicken and egg problem um, in the renewable energy sector. Uh, the issue is we don't really know what should come first with planning uh, the, these two types of infrastructure. We could uh, clearly, of course, let the power plant lead the way and then design a transmission corridor that would uh, facilitate the, trans the um, evacuation of electricity from that power plant. But of course, all of this land, existing land use and potential conflicts could crop up with this new transmission corridor, especially if it's very far from an existing line or an existing substation. To add to this issue is the fact that these two types of infrastructure projects have very different um, construction times and planning lead times. Transmission corridors, especially uh, high voltage interstate regional lines take up to a decade, if not longer to plan and construct. And that's primarily because of all of the, of the parcels of land and the different landowners that occur um, that would need to um, be, have brokered um, relationships with in order to acquire those rights of way. And then wind and solar power plants have this it's very short uh, construction time that outcompetes almost any other type of uh, power plant to date. Most certainly uh, hydropower, um, nuclear, uh, of all the green clean technologies, wind and solar have really the sh shortest construction time. So these two types of projects kind of are at odds with each other. Um, and so the location for these, the, the impacts of these types of two types of projects need to really be considered simultaneously. Location also now determines how much and where we generate renewable electricity. Um, this is shown in this figure um, that, the, that our time series profiles of um, electricity generation from an average wind farm in various regions of the US. Um, so without digging into the specific uh, shapes of each of these profiles, what you can clearly see is that they differ across the whole country. And so where we put a wind farm really determines when we expect to receive electricity from that wind farm, which has um, important consequences for how we balance the supply and demand of electricity in the grid. And so you can think of using a strategy called geographic diversification in which we 
level these peaks, we fill in the trough so that we have a baseline amount of electricity that we expect um, such that weather, weather patterns in one place can cancel out the weather patterns in another place. Um, and we can have higher predictability of generation from variable renewable energy. And the last issue I, I want to highlight um, primarily because it is the main motivation for my work um, with spatial planning is that location determines whether or not a renewable power plant is sustainable. Um, or quote unquote green. And I want to uh, start with kind of a history of where this uh, green civil war or green versus green issue started cropping up um, about 12, 13 years ago um, with a handful of very poorly cited projects in California. Um, this, this Ivan Paul project that you see uh, of an aerial image of on the right is kind of the poster child for a very poorly cited project. And um, as you can see on the right, a, the press release from Center for Biological Diversity uh, puts it very frankly, this project is just simply proposed in the wrong place. And the wrong place means it is in direct conflict with the biodiversity uh, of that area, especially with threatened um, species like the desert tortoise and numerous rare plants. Um, this plant, the argument is that this plant does not need to be there. It could be in, in any number of places that is closer to existing infrastructure um, and not in a biodiverse valley. So even though that happened 12, 13 years ago, um, this is still a common theme um, with project development and an example of this uh, more recently happening again in the Mojave Desert, um, the Yellow Pine Solar Project um, has been a, a highly contested a solar large scale solar project uh, just west of Las Vegas. Um, so this is featured in the LA Times more recently, and um, I just want to highlight the contrast in the depiction of the opposition uh, on the left and then the uh, jobs and uh, economic benefits being highlighted by the project developer on the right. Um, so there is most certainly this contrast between what is perceived to be a, a clean and sustainable technology and the location of that project and its neg potential negative impacts. Um, so I'm going to give you a few more highlight uh, highlighted um, uh, um, news article headlines to round out this argument um, and kind of see the trajectory of where this is has come and where it's potentially going. So it's been coined again, environmental paradox, green versus green, uh, solar and environmentalist clashing, green power running against desert conservation in California. And now we're seeing that this has branched out um, into communities, um, especially now that we're seeing development occurring in agricultural landscapes. Um, there have been increasing bans on solar development now in um, some prime agricultural farmland area. Um, for example, the state of Oregon has restricted solar development entirely on prime farmland. Um, so now the issue of siting has encroached in um, uh, not just natural lands, but working lands as well. Okay, so my, my central argument is the answer is very complicated um, and it really depends on the location. It will require large quantities of land, but not necessarily in comparison to fossil fuel. Um, and it is also due to the fact that we are using renewables as essential tool to fight climate change. So we are now dealing with this point in, in energy planning history in which we have to think about the location of power plants more than ever before. And with that, I'm going to um, give you a tour of several studies that um, I've been a part of with the Nature Conservancy and um, several partners, Evolved Energy Research, Montana Mountain Energy, um, and E3. I am going to uh, attempt to synthesize um, these three studies 
and uh, tell basically tell you across five to six years of doing this, what have we learned um, from trying to integrate uh, land use information and spatial planning into a traditional energy planning process. And then I'll explore some policy and planning implications of that. So the three papers or three studies that I'm referring to um, have been called Power of Place California, Power of Place West, and then now um, Power of Place National. So California started out um, in, we started this project in uh, 2018, and uh, it was very focused on California specific planning assumptions. Um, so there is a report that is directed at California policymakers for that particular reason. Um, our system boundaries in this case was uh, achieving carbon free and renewable electricity for Cal the state of California by 2050. But uh, we were able to, and we were, um, we believe that it was important to model and uh, represent the supply of potential renewable electricity and transmission from out of state. Um, and that is the current reality in California. Um, so even though we were achieving California demand and carbon targets, we um, were looking west wide for the supply of electricity. In the Western study, we expanded that scope um, to achieving a more ambitious climate target for all 11 Western states um, in the Western Electricity Coordinating Council. It's also con considered the Western Interconnect. Um, and we looked at an economy-wide target. So that is the more ambitious target. And I'll explain uh, in a little bit why. Um, this paper is published, so for those of you who want um, all of the details on how it was done, um, I'm going to point you to that, that paper that was released earlier this year. And then finally, we just released um, the Power Place National Study in the form of an executive summary. Uh, the journal paper for this is um, still very much in prep. Um, and the national study, I will say, even though it is national, it is the lower 48 states um, and we, uh, we set out a target of net zero economy-wide emissions by mid-century. So I'm gonna uh, kind of motivate the reason for the scope in each of those th uh, three studies. For California, we really, uh, when we started the study, we were in the Trump administration uh, and we were really looking at state specific goals and what states can do to contribute to climate. Um, to climate objectives. So California at that point had just passed SB 100, which is one of the first states to do so, 100% um, clean and renewable by 2045. And then with our Western study, we, we were still in the Trump administration. We were still really thinking about state level um, climate action. Um, and so we were at this, at this point now, and uh, when we started, there were uh, only a very small handful of states in the U.S. that had net zero emissions targets. Um, this has changed significantly since we started the study in the, just the last three years. The list on the right um, includes now like almost two dozen states that have some form of economy-wide net zero emissions target by mid-century. Um, which is very encouraging. And then the, uh, the other states in lighter colors of green have some form of aggressive or moderate uh, clean or renewable energy target. That's not necessarily an economy-wide greenhouse gas target. And then finally, um, when we designed the net zero, I'm sorry, the um, national study, we were looking at achieving a national goal um, in the Biden administration. So this has very much evolved politically as well. Um, with the, lo uh, the US long-term strategy, we are now given this, uh, the science community has basically converged on the fact that we need to be hitting net zero by mid-century. And that target is uh, consistent with keeping climate um, change to 1.5 degrees. So um, in our national study, we kept with that, that economy-wide greenhouse gas goal um, in a way that is consistent with the U.S. Um, LT, this long-term strategy. So I'm going to um, describe kind of the main 
research questions that we set out to answer um, across these, these three studies. Uh, in all of them, we looked at agricultural and land area area uh, in the form of land or ocean protections. Um, we modified certain types of energy pathways assumptions. Um, and we also looked at the availability of certain types of technologies over others. We modified those things and we examined how those choices um, impacted the total land use and ocean use requirements. The optimal technology investment, um, by that I mean what is the relative um, number of gigawatts or amount of generation that should come from solar versus wind versus natural gas um, or bioenergy. And what does that mean in terms of uh, energy system costs, uh, which are, of course, eventually borne by ratepayers? So that's an important criteria. And then finally, and um, is really a cornerstone of the power of police approach, is an assessment of the environmental and social impacts that are due to this, this um, scale of development. And again, we our scope is to achieve um, this net zero, or in the case of California, 100% clean and renewable target. Um, so I'm going to walk you through in one slide um, our, the framework that we've developed um, for doing this. And um, we've called it a framework because we believe that this is highly reproducible and should be used in other contexts, even though we model this or demonstrate it in the California Western context um, and now the national context. Um, so I'm going to, it'll seem like a lot of information, but, um, and I, uh, we'll all mostly be focused on the the results of this, but I do want to to highlight that um, by taking this approach, we're able to generate the results that we did. So we start out with a very extensive environmental and social data collection process. Um, and we did this for all three studies, uh, building on one another, consulted with um, several dozens of nature conservancy scientists on the environmental data side. Um, and these data sets, aggregated forms, are freely uh, openly available to the public. We then took those environmental data sets, environmental social data sets, and created uh, supplies, constrained supplies of renewable resources. Um, we call this process renewable site suitability analysis or resource mapping. And then from uh, those potential power plants that could be built, we routed transmission lines, um, what we call gen ties, uh, basically tying the generation to the nearest, to, to the existing grid or long distance uh, transmission lines that interconnect certain particular states. We took those supplies of electricity and potential power lines and we put that into a traditional um, a capacity expansion optimization model. Um, by traditional, I mean that the capacity expansion model is typically what is used in energy planning. The models that um, we partnered with Evolved Energy Research to use are, of course, highly sophisticated and have been very much updated to include um, the latest types of uh, clean and renewable energy technologies and at, are at a temporal resolution that really represents the variability of renewable generation. Um, in the site selection process, we took these portfolios, as you can see, these are kind of schematic bars. They don't have any spatial elements to them. Um, they're highly aggregated in, in the national case. Multiple uh, groups of states form basically one uh, aggregate. And so that doesn't help us um, in, the, in order to help us answer this question of what are the actual environmental and social impacts of, of achieving and building out that portfolio. So in this fifth step, we had to choose the particular sites. We had to do this process of taking aggregated results and spatially allocating them to particular areas um, in the US. And then finally, once we did that, we had this footprint of potential power plants in particular places we then conducted an impact assessment um, using several, up to a dozen uh, different types of environmental and social metrics. Um, and you'll see the results of, of that process as well. 
So before I move on to the results, I do want to um, provide a little more of the scope in what we were able to capture in these studies. So we spatially explicitly modeled onshore wind, utility scale solar, offshore wind, and transmission infrastructure. So that's our kind of our first tier of high resolution um, characterization. And then we have a second tier of potential technologies um, that are important, but we did not, didn't necessarily treat um, as spatially explicitly. So urban infill solar, um, Emily at Montero Mountain um, modeled where how much solar infill uh, utilities, I would say ground mounted solar PV could exist within urban landscapes. Um, and we also looked at using the Department of Energy um, billion ton study biomass supply data, um, which is not which is at the county level. Rooftop solar um, we use from an existing study, which is aggregated at the state level. So we use those assumptions mostly from existing studies. And then finally, these other technologies are characterized entirely non-spatially. Um, and this kind of fills in the rest of the potential generation technology, energy and te generation technologies that would be available um, out to 2050. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little more about um, a handful of those steps, um, especially those steps that uh, really ex highlight the most important contributions of these studies. The first is these environmental um, data sets that um, we generated through lots of consultations with um, science, conservation scientists. Uh, these three levels, um, siting levels, we've called um, are characterized by increasing levels of environmental protection. So in level one is kind of our siting or business as usual, which is we exclude only legally protected areas. In siting level two, um, we protect those areas that have some kind of administrative or legal designation that requires review. Um, and then also areas, land that um, is owned by, by NGOs. And then finally, we have this category um, that includes a very wide uh, diversity of data sets and area types, uh, which we're calling high conservation value. And um, these are areas that don't have any legal or administrative protections, but still have high conservation and ecological value um, that have been vetted through some type of um, eco-regional or multi-state process. And these also include lands with social, economic, or cultural value. The maps you see on the top are uh, what they look like when you put them together, siting level one. Uh, siting level two includes one and, one and two, and then siting level three is one, two, and three, so they're cumulative. And as you can see there, um, the amount of green area increases, leaving uh, fewer areas for uh, lower impact development. The two maps that I'll show you here is the result of a different type of environmental scoring process that we use at the national scale. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this because it's going to it's just going to take a lot of time to explain. Um, but suffice it to say, we took those data sets and we reallocated uh, them into a scoring system. So now it's on a scale of one to 60 in terms of the environmental impact score with the redder areas having higher impact, greener areas having lower impact, and then the environmental excluded areas, which is that siding level one, um, is depicted in this black and dark gray area. So this is what it looks like for environmental impact scores. This is the social uh, impact version. Um, and I'm, I did not go into the details of what went into the social impact score, but um, just to provide a few examples, um, we looked at uh, prime farmland. Um, and we also prefer development on marginal farmland as well as areas uh, that have been designated as energy communities um, defined by the Inflation Reduction Act. And I just want to touch upon some of the rooftop and urban infill solar assumptions because um, this is typically a, this is a really important topic and one um, for which there's a lot of interest. Um, so in two studies, we made uh, the California and Western study, um, we made some very um, aggressive assumptions about the amount of, of distributed roof, uh, PV potential. Um, so I'll just highlight here in the Western study, 
we built um, 35 to 40% of all technical rooftop and urban infill potential, which adds up to almost 200 gigawatts. Um, and in the California case, um, we took, we created a high rooftop scenario um, and that would meet up to almost one third of all load. Uh, finally, so last method slide um, before we head into the results, um, the power line routing and costing, um, this is a schematic of kind of what zoomed in version of what the power lines uh, could look like after we, we did perform this least cost path analysis. Um, we use these criteria to route these lines from a potential inter, like interconnection substation point between states. Um, and these criteria are based off of existing uh, practice. Um, we used information essentially from transmission developers on what they consider to be the most important factors when citing a transmission line. Okay. Um, so I know that there's going to be a lot of information on these slides, um, but I tried to summarize the overall finding in a sentence or a phrase um, as the head, uh, as basically the title of each slide. So we find that the total land area requirements are about three to 10% of the available area. And by available area, I'm contrasting that to in the Western US case, the land area of the Western US and the national case, um, the land area of the contiguous uh, lower 48 states. So this is a figure that compares that total amount of land area, the, the length of these gray bars um, in square kilometers. And it tells you also uh, the land area equivalent um, in using a state. Uh, so in the most um, land intensive scenario, which is a slow electrification, we don't electrify vehicles as quickly and um, we don't electrify our homes and commercial spaces as quickly. We delay that process. We need to use more electricity. Um, and that's up to half the area of New Mexico. In, in contrast that to a high electrification case, we can cut that amount of electricity generation by, I'm sorry, land use requirement by half, um, getting to only 84,000 square kilometers. Um, and that's because of the higher efficiency of using that electricity um, as opposed to using some of that biomass um, we're directly consuming electricity from wind and solar. And I will also highlight, so the one, two, and three is the high impact scenario versus the low impact scenario. Under the whole low impact, high electrification scenario, we find that um, we can achieve the lowest amount of total land area requirements. Um, one thing I'll, uh, I'll contrast that to is an electricity only scenario. So electricity only is basically um, power sector as opposed to economy wide target. And as you can see, um, it's about a third of the land use. And that's because we don't account for all the other uses of electricity that we need to decarbonize. Um, that's not just currently encompassed by the power sector. So this, this um, emphasizes how important it is to look at economy wide uh, at a net zero target. Um, these are the equivalent results from the national analysis. Um, so this is a low, this is a high impact scenario on the right, on the left, and then um, the low impact scenario on the right. And as you can see, the colored bars start to shrink. Um, the colored bars represent the amount of land that's required. In the high scenario, 300,000 uh, represents about 10% of available land area in the contiguous US. And then in the bottom right, about 100,000, that's the 3%. Um, and somewhere in between are kind of our lower impact scenarios. This is the land area equivalent. So it is sizable. So going back to that original question, is this vast? Yes, it is vast. Um, and that is because we are now completely overhauling how we are powering our homes and vehicles and economy. Okay, so the next few slides, I'm gonna show um, the build out, uh, what these maps look like, what our potential energy landscape could look like in 2050. Um, and I'll contrast that with scenarios that we deem higher impact versus those that we've deemed lower impact based on all of that environmental and social criteria that you saw earlier. Um, on the top row, um, solar, wind, and 
the transmission network under a high impact scenario. And then on the right, on the bottom, you'll see the low impact equivalent. Um, a couple of things to notice is that wind has a pretty significant shift and reduction in certain states, namely Wyoming um, and parts of uh, Nevada and uh, New Mexico. And then transmission infrastructure also reduces as a result of that, mostly as a result of that um, shift from solar to wind, to, I'm sorry, wind to solar. These are the national maps. So the reason I wanted to show the Western maps is because we were able to do the trans, we can show the transmission lines in a lot more detail um, than we could for at the national scale. Um, so the national scale, we've decided to only show the generation technologies. Um, and the generation technologies here is uh, our agrivoltaics, so co-location of wind and solar, um, fixed PV, which is a form of uh, ground-mounted solar that's um, not doesn't move, that's fixed in place, um, versus tracking PV, which is um, a single axis tracking where the panels move and track the sun in an east-west direction. And then finally, onshore wind and all that blue. So this is the 0% impact avoided scenario. So this is our uh, sort of our high impact. And then uh, this is our 70% impact avoided scenario. So it still meets that net zero emissions target, uh, but now with a different mix of technologies and different quantities. Um, and these, the, this particular slide shows that um, relative mix. So when I asked earlier in the, the number of uh, when we when I introduced the research questions, I said we really are interested in also how this impacts the optimal investments. We see that in a higher impact scenario, we have more wind, and in a lower impact scenario, we shift um, some of that wind, about twenty five percent of that, and shift it into investments in solar. Um, this is just a schematic uh, depicting what this looks like. Um, I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into every detail. Um, but I'll, I'll highlight just a couple of them. Um, we do see that there's an you know, emphasis on, on shifting tracking solar to fix, which is more land use efficient. And uh, we see that tracking solar also goes more into co-location and agrivoltaics um, when we reduce the amount of land use impacts. Um, so the cost impacts, I we believe uh, are very modest on the whole there. Um, between two to 10% across the three studies we've performed. In the Western study, we find that in the high electrification scenario, citing level three, it's a cost premium of just 3%. In the national study, um, here, if we look at just this 70% uh, impact reduction scenario, it's a cost premium of 6%. Um, but if we look at reducing environmental impact by 50%, it's only a 2% cost increase. Okay, so the last step in the analysis was to perform an environmental impact assessment. Um, so without going into details of all of the uh, results, I just want to highlight um, two big ones. Um, the first is that environmental protections are significantly important um, in protecting lands that would otherwise be developed. So if we look at just these two sets of bars here. This is um, for generation, this is for power lines. If we don't, and this is the amount of impact to the height of the bars. If we don't protect hive conservation value areas, we see a lot of development in those areas. And in this third scenario, which we remove all that area from development, we see that it's all avoided. In contrast, um, where, where we are seeing development increasingly is agricultural lands, and that helps uh, explain this uh, kind of the shift, the trajectory of development in ecologically important landscapes to development in agricultural landscapes, which is um, what we are seeing with our modeling work. So this increase in agricultural land use um, in the lower impact siting levels. In the national study, um, what we did was, again, similarly, we assessed the impact on particular types of species and habitats. Um, the big takeaway from this slide um, in this figure is that um, of the total area of each of these intact wetlands, forest areas in the in uh, the contiguous U.S., 
in the low impact scenarios, we only achieve a very like a dot of that total big circle. Um, so the the seventy percent reduction impact scenario that you see in that light green um, represents less than two percent of the big green dots you see on the far right. Um, and you can also contrast that with these um, with these brown colored dots. That's kind of our signing as usual scenario. So that's the amount of avoided land use impact that we would achieve if we had smarter siting practices and planning. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I'm not, well, okay, I'll, I will try to explain this without getting into the details of the, of the um, figure itself. Um, we did do an analysis of um, people and how close they are to infrastructure projects. Um, and we find that on the whole, uh, and this is, this is a figure basically showing the distance from a wind farm and the number of people that would be within that distance. And the colored lines show the three different uh, scenarios and contrast that to the existing wind farms um, in the US. So without having to stare at this and make sense of it, um, the conclusion is that if we kind of take a middling distance um, and uh, add up all of these four different types of infrastructure types, we find that at least 10% of the people in the US would become host to a new energy infrastructure project, uh, which is significant. So that visibility of energy in our landscape is very much going to be a potential issue. And then finally, um, we did an analysis at the national for the national study of uh, impacts and benefits to energy communities. Um, these bars, the height, the length of these bars indicate the number in millions of people um, in energy communities that would become you know, host to these types of infrastructure projects. And we find that in the lower impact scenarios, when we encourage more development in energy communities, they are, are higher. Um, and we broke we, these correspond to particular regions that we've summarized this in, these results for. Um, one potential benefit of that is that it brings up to um, 10 million new jobs oops, in these communities. Um, and, uh, and to um, clarify, energy communities as defined by the Inflation Reduction Acts are those that have historically hosted fossil fuel extraction processing or generation facilities. Okay, so I'm going to summarize this um, to wrap it up. So um, we find that, yes, it's possible for the U.S. to meet its most ambitious climate goals while minimizing conservation impacts and directing benefits to um, fossil fuel communities. Um, the high electrification scenario is really our most efficient pathway. We find modest shifts in technology investments, um, but it, this is still a very much a wind and solar dominated system. The role of land sparing technologies and siting strategies is considerable. Um, so we need to kind of have an all hands on deck approach um, to utilizing these types of, tech, of siting strategies. We're really looking at a very modest cost premium for doing this. Um, and then does not of course include the mitigation costs associated with higher impact siting. And then if we don't uh, plan Accordingly, we may um, see very significant uh, negative impacts to important habitat. And then finally, um, we have preliminary evidence to suggest that environmental and social criteria are largely synergistic. Okay, um, the very last slide, and then I'll, I'll try to be quick so that we have some time for questions. Um, we're taking, currently we have a project by project assessment of environmental impacts and social and cultural suitability, um, hence the certain types of uh, backlashes against certain specific projects uh, leading to big headlines. Um, our argument, uh, as demonstrated through our, our studies, is that if we integrate land use into the planning framework in a more systematic way, we can encourage more uh, comprehensive and engaged democratic local and regional spatial planning. And we are already seeing this, um, lease conflict siting plans. Um, Washington is currently conducting one for solar. Uh, BLM is revamping their solar um, programmatic environmental impact statement. And California has kind of led the way in doing this renewable energy conservation planning process. 
what we're starting to see more of is this actual integration into energy planning, which is uh, coming out, uh, manifesting in the form of these land use screens in ca the California resource planning process. New York has actually created an office of renewable energy uh, siting and uh, to ensure that projects are adequately permitted in a timely and ecologically sound way. What we aren't seeing as much of, and um, I'm hoping that uh, this will change <laughs> over the next several years, um, is that we actually do more of that end of that pipeline. We do the impact assessment as part of the planning process. Um, and then we actually integrate resource planning in a coordinated bottom-up way um, by vetting these potential projects um, at, a, at a more local level. And with that, um, I'm going to wrap it up and say thank you to um, a very long list of collaborators and contributors to all of this work and um, funding support from a large handful of of uh, foundations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. You covered so much ground in um, in this time. So we're we're grateful for this explanation and your work. Um, we do have a few questions. I'm going to um, try to get to some of them, as many of them as possible. So you know, try to make your your answers as concise as you can. One is, I think, a quick one, um, which is, do you have plans to look at Hawaii, Alaska, and the territories for any of this work? Um, we don't have immediate plans, but the Nature Conservancy Alaska chapter has already expressed a lot of interest in doing something like this for just the state of Alaska. Great. Good here. Um, another question, what role do state regulatory bodies like public utility commissions play or need to play to improve siting of renewable energy projects and also to protect ratepayers from unfair cost increases to support those projects? What they have been doing, so public utilities commission, the I my main example is for California. So apologize from a California centric perspective. Um, California has actually done a decent job of incorporating these uh, considerations in the form of what they've called land use screens for resource potential. So they're trying to get ahead of the curve by basically saying that these are going to be bad projects and you shouldn't go there. Um, and they've actually incorporated um, the results from our California specific study. They've used the data that we've generated in that siting level to um, and added that to their suite of uh, land use screens. Um, so it is making its way into the planning process. And um, if I had more time, I'd, I'd wanna describe the way that that impacts procurement of actual projects. Um, but just in short, it basically means that we're not planning transmission in bad places, in poorly sited potential projects. Thanks. Well, and building on that, um, this is the uh, question coming from someone in Rhode Island, although this is uh, relevant much more broadly than Rhode Island. Um, in Rhode Island, we've seen a lot of clear cutting of forests for solar siting. How can cities and towns develop policies to site solar in more industrial settings, rooftops or warehouses, parking lots, et cetera? Um, obviously, the, the lowest cost option is ground mount, does the Inflation Reduction Act help make other options more appealing? That's um, this a is few a questions problem. there. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, you will probably be interested in a forthcoming study that's being released by the Massachusetts Audubon Society. They worked with Evolved Energy to uh, basically do power of place, but for Massachusetts. Mm. Um, and they found that there's going to be an increasingly large role for much smaller ground mounted projects that don't cause uh, deforestation um, and quite a large role for rooftop solar. So in terms of incentivizing that um, net energy metering, don't do what California is doing and introduce net, net energy metering 3.0. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to continue to incentivize rooftop solar because it is on a levelized cost basis about a third, like, 300 times more expensive. Uh, I'm sorry, 300% more expensive. So um, the IRA, as far as I know, uh, incentivizes both, but it doesn't disproportionately incentivize rooftop solar. In fact, in some okay. ways, it probably disproportionately incentivizes ground mount. Wow, interesting. 
Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, similar to agrovoltaics, uh, which as you explained, um, combine wind and solar, correct? Yes. I'm um, sorry, uh, agrovoltaics is, I'm sorry, I should have explained this. Agrovoltaics is um, putting solar into agricultural landscapes. And specifically, we looked at just crops, croplands, as opposed to rangelands and grazing lands. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I got that wrong. Um, so the question here is, um, similar to agrovoltaics, then are there opportunities for pollinator or meadow plantings under solar farms? Um, I, don't, I don't know if you know this or not, but does this, does this add cost because you have to raise the structures? Does it help to mitigate impacts near high value conservation areas? Uh, yes, this is an increasingly uh, popular way to increase the ex social acceptance of solar, like you ground mounted solar in, in close to communities and in agricultural landscapes. Um, typically, they haven't been, I haven't seen them under the panels. They've usually been kind of like hedgerow style, like at the fringe of the plants. Mm -hmm. um, but I've definitely, this is increasingly going to be a strategy uh, for reducing the impact and actually providing co-benefit. Um, you don't need to rack the, the increase the height of the panels if I think you're just going to leave the existing, um, if you're going to like keep pollinator habitat. But you do need to do this if you're going to pursue agrivoltaics. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, well, unfortunately, there were a few more questions, but we're out of time. So I will bring us to a close. And thank you, Dr. Grace Wu, for sharing all of this really fascinating work with us. Um, thanks to all of you who joined us today. We're thrilled that you are here. And I want to remind you that this is just the first of our lectures in this year's series. The rest of them will take place each Thursday of June, um, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. Next week, June 8th, um, we hope you'll join us to hear from Dr. Sergio Castellanos Rodriguez of the University of Texas at Austin. He will discuss planning, policy, and partnership innovations, a lot of P's in the transportation sector, specifically to advance um, an equitable clean energy future. And per the links in the chat, um, don't forget, we have an opportunity for a, a match of any gifts that you make to Metcalf Institute this month. We hope you will pursue that option. And with that, thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>